everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Ghost Furnace. As always, I am Bond here with my cohort, Nick Pennsylvania. How you doing, Nick? I am doing real good. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. So uh, we're coming to you on a very snowy and cold evening here in Western Pennsylvania. Um, Hope everyone out there is staying warm, staying dry, staying safe. And we thought tonight would be a perfect night to just kind of like cozy up a little bit. We've been talking about pies, stories about cryptids, about ghosts, about UFOs, paranormal activity. And it's it's that time of year. So I think that it's been really great that folks have been um, thinking about those things as well and kind of reaching out to us a lot lately. Um, I have a few comments that people have. Nick, you mentioned that you had a few other comments as well from folks. Yeah, I just, uh, we do really want to thank everybody. Recently, this past month or two, we've been hearing a lot from some new voices. And uh, of course, there's those people out there who have been engaging with us for a while now, and we appreciate all of it. Uh, There was a Ricky Grant who uh, had made a comment in our earlier episode, and uh, he just wanted to thank us and keep the stories coming. He is enjoying learning the folklore and legends, and we appreciate it. Uh, reaching out, letting us know. And, uh, of course, uh, th- these last few episodes from the Green Children of Wool Pit to their most recent, the D.B. Cooper, have generated quite a bit of commentary. I have know I know I have heard from more than one pe- person who has said uh, something to the effect of, well, you forgot about this really right. high-profile potential D.B. Cooper person. And, well, that's the problem, is I feel like there's a dozen... Right. Really strong contenders. And I think I said something in our conversation about it's uh, if you can look at any one person long enough and all of a sudden they match. And then if right. you look at them just a minute longer, <laughs> you can see all the faults with it. Right. Right. No, that's a really good point. And um, with with a lot of these things that we talk about on here, like we're really only scratching the surface with a lot of them. And I think the D.B. Cooper episode is a perfect example of that. One of the sets of comments that we did get from uh, one of our listeners, Bowie, who's written in a number of times, she said that uh, two things. One, I think the large ears would have been noticed. We don't notice eye color most of the time because most people don't have wide eyes with an obvious color. Obviously, there are exceptions to those people uh, usually get told that their eyes are the most striking feature, which is something that I kind of mentioned. Um, uh, you got to get close and personal to really tell eye color. But a guy with short hair <laughs> and large ears is totally going to get noticed. People use uh, people use to get their ears pinned back surgically for a reason. Yeah, I wonder how I wonder how prevalent that was. I I have heard that though. And I don't know if this person's ears were that large. I I don't know. I'm in a moment of duress, what do you notice? What do you certainly I I don't know. Right, right. I, I've never heard of pinning ears, so I'm gonna have to look that up. That's a thing. Like you like get your is like like early plastic surgery kind of thing. Yeah. I'm not sure how far back it goes, but yeah, it, it was something. And I do know, uh, I believe the early ear thing too about, you know, the attached earlobes, right? Yeah. Some people have earlobes that are attached. And uh, you're yeah, I'm checking. Not. I'm checking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have heard that there were early operations in order to do something about that i believe this is all cosmetic but mm, okay yeah i don't know i i would imagine that as far as plastic surgery goes the ear would be a good place to start Makes because sense. you know it's low risk right exactly yeah, yeah. but and yeah that- i don't know much about that other than i have heard that that was a thing so yes i i can imagine uh, i just I don't think that this person's ears stuck out exceptionally. Right, right. To right. be so, I, I don't yeah, but, know. Yeah, but it was, but it, but it was noted. You know, that was a st- striking feature. Of that I'll, I'll say this: I could definitely see someone noticing it. I could just as easily again see someone just looking right past that. Right. Yeah. It's it's kind of eye of the beholder kind of thing. Um, and then she had a second comment uh, on someone you were talking about. I'm pretty firm on McCoy being a copycat. 
In regards to the cigarettes, I am a non-smoker, but I would occasionally smoke cloves socially. One time I was out on the porch in the winter with a friend who was a real who was a real smoker. I tried smoking two cigs back to back and quickly felt dizzy and nauseous. I have a call to the mix and there's no way he would have gotten uh he wouldn't have gotten sloppy. Uh secondly, having the 16-year-old drive him to to his home address is such a dumb move couldn't agree more i uh, agree especially with some of the conversation that went on in there that you know set off alarms come on right now. right and she brings up the good point that he says i have a hard time believing the man who orchestrated uh such a uh meticulously crafted plan would do something that dumb um uh, mccoy was just copying db's genius plan and then bungling in the end which i think is yeah. an excellent point i i'm gonna say this and this is gonna sound a lot like the ear comment but, right. <laughs> but I mean, let's give McCoy some credit. Like it was a daring thing to do. The MO, I, I could it be a copycat 100%. Right. But it could also be the result of if let's just entertain for the sake of argument that McCoy was Cooper. Mm -hmm. Cooper could have land, made his way to a highway somewhere and gotten picked up by a less scrupulous, a less suspicious mm. person or called on a payphone and got a ride somewhere and somebody didn't think much beyond that. I still go back to my belief, though, is that, you know, D.B. Cooper didn't survive very long after leaping from the plane. Again, as we note, that mm -hmm. money was not ever traced back into circulation. And right. I'm sure, I'm sure... That as of the 90s and the digitization, I would imagine that uh, somewhere some system was set up to trigger any time one of those bills came through or something. Because it was still, I mean, this case was open with the FBI until, until 2016. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, I definitely believe McCoy could be a copycat. I just find him to be supremely interesting because mm -hmm. he was able to to execute right. the exact same hijacking with, again, the same MO. Uh, it was really in just the the cleanup after the fact that everything starts to blunder about. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think, but I think across the board, all good points. There's so much in this case that it's just so hard to like cover everything. And the more you look, some t depending on how you're looking at it, you're like, oh, this is definitely the guy. Then five minutes later, you're like, mm, I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's like, well, it's if you're staring in the bathroom mirror too long and you notice your ears for the first time and then all <laughs> you can think about is how weird ears are and then it's all you can think about the rest of the day. Right. I will say there was another comment. Apparently there was a little bit of a conversation about uh, my accent, apparently. <laughs> and I, I take the task only because... It was presumed that it's a Midwest or a, a Pittsburgh thing. I am not from Pittsburgh. I'm not from Pennsylvania. Uh, I did move here when I was young, but I could already read and write and speak. And I am sure that my original voice has altered somewhat. But I am still ridiculed for the way I say <laughs> sorry and milk and pen, the writing utensil. And uh, what are some other words? Well, that I like... Being, uh being yeah I, I can relate because like i went to a public school here in pennsylvania obviously so yes you you, um, you li you've lived in western pennsylvania yes. your whole life so we were taught and i'm sure a lot, a lot of other folks listening have been in this we were taught what's called phonetic spelling which sounds like a great thing to teach the kids like oh you spell things how you say them well if you have an accent like a lot of us like a lot of us do around here uh it takes you very long into life till you realize you're spelling certain words completely wrong <laughs> there's a lot of examples of me for my job typing in front of a lot of people and i try and type something three <laughs> or four times and they just have to just pick a new word in front of a hundred people because i'm like oh I can't spell that word apparently because uh, I say it funny, <laughs> you know. Um, I thought I thought it was H U T D O G, not H O T D O G for the word hot dog, because um, I don't say hot. Hot dog sounds right. strange to me. It's hot dog. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you one right now. Um, you know that animal with a shell? Yes. A, what, what do you call that? I call it a turtle. Right. Right. T U R D. Yeah. Not a turtle. Turtle, yeah, turtle, right. yeah, yep. And yep. Then, and when you try to put that T in there, it's so hard. And turtle. I would say around here too, I hear uh, ladder and latter. Oh yeah, it's sure. the same word, ladder 
or ladder. I could get a like lot that. around here. I feel like a lot of the T's are softened to D's. Oh, they are for sure. And the interesting thing for me again is with like the Pennsylvania Deitch, the German speaking, the Pennsylvania Deitch, the German that they speak does the same thing. A lot of the T sounds become more like D sounds. Which I think is interesting because these are two different languages, right? And they do so clearly. Um, there's a lot of influence, but no, I I learned to speak and read and write in Louisiana and Mississippi, so that was pretty yeah. well set before I came up here. But I'm sure that there are some Midwestern things oh, which have sure. slipped into my mode of speech over the years because we've lived here. I've lived here since the '90s, but. Right. Yeah, so I just I had to take the task. The name's Nick Pennsylvania because I am like that uh, the person, the immigrant that arrives and becomes the zealous convert. Right. Yes. You're. Yes. You've. You, you've. Yeah. That's. I was that's, making that's a good shoe fly it. pie today for. Right. Yeah. Out again, loud. Get back to our pie conversation. Um, we could do a whole podcast just on pies. I bet we should really. Well, have to be a special episode sometime. A but, very uh, special but, episode. But speaking of special episodes and speaking of uh, influences, like you, like you mentioned. So, as you guys know, um, two weeks ago we we did our episode on the greed children of Wool Pit. While researching that episode, looking at the idea of them coming from Flanders and everything, I started looking into other folklore of that area. I was really kind of hoping I was going to find um, like in-depth stories that we could do, but instead kind of what I found was a lot of like folklore that is like very old, very, very complex. And a lot of it kind of sounds like stuff that we have over here. So that kind of just got me running down this rabbit hole. We say rabbit hole a lot. I feel like that's a, um, that's obviously like an Alice in Wonderland reference and she wasn't like a willing participant in the rabbit hole. I thought she was, and I don't, was it a rabbit hole or she was chasing a rabbit and going through all oh, the doors and everything? Oh, there was the doors. You're right. So um, I thought that was what that's referencing. I guess I was wrong. It um, might be, but I, I'm not sure actually. Warrens are complex, but, but what I'm saying is I'm, when I go into these things, it's very much uh, purposeful. you know. <laughs> um, and so I came across a lot of just like lesser known cryptids, um, that got me thinking about just lesser known, lesser known cryptids a lot over here too. We spend a lot of time talking about like the big ones in the sense of like Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Mothman, Jersey Devil, you know, uh, things along that along along that nature. There's a lot of really cool lesser known cryptids. Some of the ones from over in Flanders that I kind of wanted to talk about real quick were new to me. You know. Nick, are you familiar with the Mawat? I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. M A H W O T. Absolutely not. So neither was I. So this is one of those large lizard-like monsters that uh lives in the uh, lives in a river over there, M E U S E. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. But what this monster does is it lives in the lives in the river and everything, and it was kind of, from what I can tell, used as like a cautionary tale almost over there for kids to stay away from the river because it's this big like lizard thing. It says it's said to be the size of a calf. It's used in folk tales over there, and one of the common phrases is it's basically saying if you don't do your chores, if you don't stay inside, if you don't behave, they say you'll be eaten by the mawat, and that got me thinking about how. We've always said that a lot of like, uh, you know, the kind of some of the PA lumber monsters and, you know, dangerous areas, people have these stories where they're cautionary. They're meant to like keep kids away. There's some utility to them. I think the first time I was ever introduced to folklore as having that sort of utilitarian mm -hmm. function, the, the first time that it was ever put out as the purpose of the story is, mm -hmm. of course, the kids at Lover's Lane in the car making out. There's the hook, the man with right. the hook who's escaped an asylum or a prison. I think everybody's familiar with that story or some itineration right. of it. Of course, it was only made more real where there were at least a couple serial killers that were identifying targets who were in same sort of situation which i think only solidified the legend further but again it's my understanding and i have a 
I have a book back here, there's documents, um, the origins of the story. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding that it goes back to at least the 1920s where it was utilized for that purpose because the new meat mode by which to uh, get that freedom in order to get away from kind of the eyes of propriety, mm -hmm. you know, was the automobile. And th the hook, the story uh, really does result revolve around the automobile and the dangers of being mm -hmm. out alone together, you know. So it's, right, it's a moralist yeah. tale, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, so I mean, again, like you said, like there's kind of some utility to it, and I thought that was an interesting, just kind of parallel. Like again, a lot of these a lot of cultures are more alike than they are different. You know, when it sure. Comes, when it comes and, to and obviously, this isn't a a moral, right? You know, mm -hmm. but this is uh, definitely a, a safety thing. Right, right. While looking into that, I found another creature from East Flanders, in the municipality of Dender. Um, this one is called a Cludie, K L U D D E. Have you ever heard of this one, Nick? I'm just going to, I'm going to be pretty safe in saying no. I don't. <laughs> to most of these, yeah. I mean. Because <laughs> i never heard I of will, any of these. I will admit, like, I, I can find Belgium on a map, okay? Right. And I understand that Flanders is like the northern area of Belgium. Right. That, is, and, and other than that, I can hear some Dutch right. and understand it. Outside of that, that, yeah. that pretty much thoroughly exhausts my intimate knowledge. knowledge of the people yeah. of Belgium. No, I'm in the same way. That's why I found a lot of this stuff so 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 fascinating. So this one, this creature, the Cludi, is a large dog-like creature that walks on its hind legs. Kind of has some werewolf vibes. The thing I thought that was interesting about it is, is it's said to have like, you know, like the claws and be sinister and everything. Um, but then it has these bracelets that it wears in a lot of the photos that I found. Um, okay, so this is an interesting aspect of Right, this. like it has it has accoutrement. It has like some stuff that comes with it. Um, what do the bracelets do? Because I'm sure they're not only there for decoration because that would just be a weird additive to the story. Right, so so I you know beware. There's right. this thing. It's a dog and it walks around. It wears bracelets. What what what, what about the? Oh, nothing, nothing. It just. It does have them, and you it should just, know. It just has them. Well, it's funny, because that's not actually the weirdest thing about this upright dog creature, is it apparently has green scales. It is part partly, like, amphibious or aquatic. So it kind of almost has, like, a, uh, a dog man or, you know, werewolf slash alligator or lizard person. That is thing. interesting, but I need you to come back around to the bracelets. So the bracelets, I couldn't, I didn't see anything that said exactly why I had the bracelets, but the story, a few of the stories that looked like mentioned, you could hear the jingling of the bracelets as it was coming. So almost like Marley's chains or something along yeah. those lines, where there's an auditory. Or a uh, cat with a bell on it. To or a cat with a bell. Birds. Right, exactly. Well, maybe that's that. See, that I kind of, I kind of like that explanation. We're, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, that which suggests that this amphibious dog thing belongs to somebody that maybe doesn't want people getting eaten. Right. Well, see, and that kind of makes it sound if that's if that's the reason that that makes it sound like it's like almost like kind of still someone's pet or someone is in charge of it. And what that kind of reminded me of is gets into the next thing one of the things that can save you from this thing if you come across it whether it's hiding in uh a, like a river bank or if it's in the if it's in the trees under bridges some of the some of the accounts and some of the paintings and everything say um if you distract it with a handkerchief it is compelled to rend it apart like to tear it and everything and and like get rid of it and what that sounds like to me is a lot of the um, kind of early, I don't want to say witch stuff, because it's, it seems like it's usually more like Satan oriented, but you hear stories about like Trotterhead having to count the posts and like anything but like this idea of like a compulsion that some of these things have. Um, right. And, and I'd love to know if there's more to that, like uh, juxtaposition there. But it's supposed to be a very dangerous creature, and that's like one of the ways you can get get away from it. Um, you know, the compulsion thing is is an interesting thing right. because I haven't thought of that as being a characteristic of a lot of 
cryptid or folkloric things like vampires and whatnot. But, you know, come to think of it, I seem to remember reading some um, Asian folklore Mm-hmm. And there was something about, I forget if it was grains or rice. Well, I guess rice is a grain. But if you spilled them in front of this thing, it would have to sit and gather them and maybe even right. count them. Mm-hmm. And that was your means by which of escaping. Escape. So that does seem to be something that it's not universal. Right. But it does seem to be something that uh, is a shared trait among different cultural figures so that's interesting i never right. i never considered that a thing now this the story of this beast too is it another one of those um like i think of the movie the village where there's right. the hide behind type oh, figure yeah. to keep people out of the woods right right and that it's it's very possible um this this might be something that is like you know uh again cautionary as we as we mentioned as we mentioned earlier and i'm gonna have to go back and look at um, I believe in the long lost friend in that book. Um, I believe there's stuff about compulsion and counting and things like that. So we might have to do a little more of a deep dive into that. Do you, do you have it handy? I think I almost fell out of my chair, but um, I do. Give me one moment. Yeah, no problem. That I had to dig out my copy of the long lost friend. This is a old grimoire. I know we've talked to Robert Phoenix in an earlier episode, and we talked mm-hmm. extensively about this book. Uh, but this is an old Pennsylvania German Catholic grimoire, and I think this is somewhat fitting as next door to me is the old German Catholic Church. But mm-hmm. okay, so the thing to which you were referencing, uh, the headline is, or the um, the title is, to prevent witches from bewitching cattle, to be written and placed in the stable. And against bad men and evil spirits, which nightly torment old and young people, to be written and placed on the bedstead. So here's what you have to write. And either put it in the stable or on the bedstead. Trotter head, I forbid thee my house and premises. I forbid thee my horse and cow stable. I forbid thee my bedstead, that thou mayest not breathe upon me. Breathe into some other house. Until thou hast ascended every hill, until thou hast counted every fence post, and until thou hast mm. crossed every water, and thus dear day may come again into my house in the name of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yes. That's what you have to write. And uh, it, the author asserts that this will certainly protect and free all persons and animals from witchcraft. So again, yeah, they have to uh, breathe into some other house until they've climbed every hill. The county every, every fence yeah. post. That's that's what every I was thinking. Every fence post. Every fence post. That's, every water. Yep. That's 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 worldwide. Right. That's so cool. It doesn't limit it to a county. Right. <laughs> or any. Yeah, this right. is not a, a municipal ordinance. Right. Right. No, and that's and that's what I liked about this story with the uh, uh, the the Cludy here is because it, 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 it mentioned the compulsion. It used that word that was compelled. So it's not like it's just you're distracting it. Um, it's like it wants to get you, but it has to do this first. That's one of those things that to me always sounds like a mechanism or rules. And anytime we find those things with these kind of subjects, I get excited. You know, it it, it seemed like. It's nice that there are rules. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> but who yeah. sets these? One, it, it is the weird thing. It is clearly these are fab- human fabrications. I am kind of curious to see these two uh, folk things, how, how frequently the people in that region refer to them today. Mm-hmm. And just on the subject of rules, could you think of any sort of figure that has more such rules associated with it? than vampires vampires vampire and that's seriously you have to invite them in yeah there's yeah there's a lot with 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 vampires um i'd say the only thing close is like a derivative which is like the whole black-eyed children phenomenon um yeah they need to be invited in apparently that's like part of like and again i know that it's creepypasta and everything but like it's might as well be folklore now because people talk about it what's the difference Um, what's exactly what's the difference so like um 
but in but a lot of with a lot of those stories they say about them them trying to get into someone's house or into the car or something. So again, the rules I think are I don't know. Like I think it's kind of like whenever it makes me feel like we're studying something scientifically, and I know that's like a me thing, not like a not like it actually matters. But it makes it feel like there is a answer that we can attain like as if there's a mechanism then we can figure it out and that means we can make progress with these things and i i know that's not the point but that's why i get excited about it because it kind of triggers that for me i think we can leave it at there but we like i again i just want to underline we really appreciate everybody that's engaged with us um we you know just some of the feedback some of your thoughts and theories on the things we've been having conversations about we really appreciate if you have a story or something you think we should talk about, maybe looking up a cryptid or a folk legend of some other culture, where can people reach out to us? You can find us on Instagram or Facebook, or you can send us an email, good old fashioned email, at the ghost furnace podcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm.